webinar. Uh, we'll be getting started in just a few minutes. First, I thought I would tell you about some upcoming events. Um, if you're going to be at the NCSA conference, the National Conference on Student Assessment that's happening in uh, National Harbor, Maryland this week, Dr. John Freeman is going to be co-presenting on preventing, detecting, and investigating test security irregularities. Um, and this is a comprehensive guidebook on test security for states that he'll be presenting on. Our next uh, series, our next webinar in the upcoming Caveat webinar series will be July 17th. And it will be test security lessons from the National Co Conference on Student Assessment. So the conference is going on right now. We'll be providing some highlights of that conference. Um, what um, a new what is it? that we're just doing at Cavion is called the Cavion Security Minute. And you can find it out on our website under resources. And it's just uh, our own Skylar Weisenberger giving you tips, secu test security tips, um, uh, just like at a, you know, a, for a quick minute. So it's a great kind of brush up to help keep you fresh on what you should be thinking about with regard to test security. Um, some of the latest publications that have come out, uh, of course, are the, the Handbook of Test Security. And this is now available. You can find it um, either on Amazon or through the, the Rutledge website. This is a great reference book. And uh, it's written by a lot of different luminaries in the field. So it's just a, a good um, bit of information on different areas of test security. And the TILSA guidebook is going to be coming out this week. Um, they're going to be announcing it at, uh, at the NCSA conference. Um, and so that will be uh, available through their website for like $4. It's, it's pretty, pretty reasonable. <laughs> we'll be getting started in just a couple minutes. We want to make sure we um, allow some time for for more folks to get on this morning. Um, just some places that you can stay in touch with Cavion are uh, Security Insights blog. We have a blog that comes out once a week. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at, at Cavion. We also have a group in LinkedIn called Cavion Test Security. So we're always looking for contributions and questions um, as a way to kind of share our knowledge with regard to test security. Um, and lastly, Facebook. Um, we're on Facebook, so you can like us out there. You can tell us how you like the new Test Security Minute. So again, we'll be getting started in just a couple of minutes as we wait for more people to join the webinar today. Please note that you as listeners are in listen-only mode. So if you do have questions along with the presentation today, go ahead and put them in the question box. I'll be checking that and then uh, facilitating with our presenters, um, you know, making sure that those questions get answered. We'll be getting started in just, uh, just another minute or so. We'll wait for more folks to join us today. <clears throat> You can see that uh, some more folks are joining us, but I think we will go ahead and get started. It's about two minutes after the hour. So I'd like to introduce our presenters today. Our topic today is protecting your tests using copyright law. And we're very fortunate to have with us Ken Horton, who's an associate professor of IP strategy for the Gore Business School at Westminster College in Utah. Also joining him today is one of our senior Web Patrol security analyst, Kerry Straw. So with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Kerry right now. Kerry? Thanks so much, Jamie. I really appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for attending. Um, some of you may know of a study by psychometrician Russell Smith that looked at the impact of brain dump sites on item exposure and item parameter drift. 
And during the study, an internet search of free brain dump sites found that roughly 25% of the item bank was exposed within three weeks of the exam being published live and with a fair amount of accuracy. And after eight months, nearly the entire exam bank, over 200 items, was posted with nearly perfect accuracy. And that even included the answer key. So that's what can quickly happen when you don't protect your IP asset. Anyone can copy it, steal it, change it, sell it for a profit. So that's what I quickly want to share today is how websites, and more specifically brain dump sites, are blatantly profiting from your unprotected exams. Next slide, please. First of all, there's intentional theft and blatant infringement. So what that means is there are thousands of websites that purposefully steal your test questions and sell them for profit as a test prep software package. Um, also as a study guide, a phone app. Um, there's many different permutations of this, um, this uh, infringement. Um, the bigger problem is that these websites are very incestuous. Next, up, next slide, please. So this slide, the amount of information on here isn't necessarily what you need to take, take away from this. It's just that one brain dump can gain access to your test questions. And within a very short matter of time, those test questions could be all over the internet and available to anyone just by conducting a simple Google search. If we look at this brain dump family tree slide, we see that the top website, itsolexpert.com, owns 62 other websites that sell the exact same list of test questions. Now, this site then keeps adding new sites to their family of test prep sites, increasing the exposure to your content, and it really doesn't do any more for them other than adding another URL. So, <coughs> excuse me, it can just become a huge problem very, very quickly. Then another site, for example, exambible.com, currently owns 25 sites, but they also own dozens of blog archives for each of those sites that talk and link to the main site. Now, to make the problem even worse, there are also hundreds of other sites completely unrelated to either of these that then siphon off of those websites, steal the test questions from them to then sell as their own. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Now, those are blatant infringements, but not all instances of copyright infringement are intentional. But you still have a right to protect your authored content, even if the website doesn't intentionally steal your exam material. Now, here are some examples of the types of sites that may unintentionally have your actual exam material. There's homework and project help sites, freelancer sites, um, discussion groups, uh, discussion public forums, uh, chat rooms, auction sites such as eBay and Craigslist, as well as the social networking sites, uh, the big ones, of course, Facebook and Twitter. Now, these sites themselves have the honest intention of really trying to help students and test takers. And a homework or project help site such as JustAnswer.com doesn't want to share stolen material. In fact, they really make the registered user sign an agreement that what the user posts is not someone else's property nor does it violate academic honor code, et cetera. Next slide, please. Now, here's an excerpt from an actual terms of use agreement for, our, for one of these sites. Quote, you're not allowed to and agree not to use any of the solutions, answers, materials, or information available on or through the website, whether in whole or in part, to cheat. Some examples include, number one, submitting any textbook solutions from the website as your own to any class, and two, any other violation of your instructor or school's academic honor code, unquote. Next slide, please. So what we kind of want to do is give you some tools to help you deal with these um, both blatant and unintentional infringements. First of all, if you want to create allies and work as a team with these websites, so make an initial contact. Start warm and friendly. Call first, email first, do anything that you can to make an initial friendly contact with the site owners. Then <clears throat> if they don't respond back, send a friendly bystander letter, which we'll talk about the details of those in a little bit, to reinforce that initial caller contact if that doesn't work. 
hopefully by that time they'll see that you're fairly serious, you have a, a valid argument, and they will get back in touch with you. And then you can start building a relationship. If that doesn't work, then you can send cease and desist letters, uh, reference the DMCA, uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, that Ken's going to talk about more details of in a little bit. We're, uh, but the whole goal is to build relationships with forum owners and make them your friends. Now, you're not accusing the website of copyright infringement. You're notifying them that one of their users violated their terms of use on their site. So let the unintentional websites know that you're helping them avoid copyright infringement by notifying them that one of their users posted your intellectual property on their site. Now, it's really easy because you're upset that you want to seek revenge and get this site shut down and, and make sure that this never happens again. But don't do that. Stay professional. You'll actually get more uh, results in your favor if um, you have a nice, friendly relationship. If you, it, it'll only cause more harm if you take it personally and put the other side on the defensive and make it much more difficult to get um, things taken down. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, before we turn the time over to Ken, we'd like to ask the audience a poll question. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll question. And this is, question is, when you have found your stolen property on a website, have you sent a takedown notification? So the poll is open. Go ahead and uh, we can have people answer. Looks like some um, responses are coming in right now. And I'll just um, mention to everyone as well as we're voting today, this session is going to be recorded. So we will send a link out to the recording probably um, in a few days. Um, and so that will be available to you. Also, if you do have questions, rather than raising your hand, since all the, the mics are muted, go ahead and um, text me a question, and I'll make sure to get that question to our presenters. OK, well, it looks like just about everybody has answered. So let's look at our results of the poll. Um, I'm hoping you guys can let me share that. Okay, here we go. So uh, it looks like 57% have take you know have done some takedown notices. 12% have not, and 31 are not sure. Hmm. So it sounds like there's some information we can impart to help some of these folks um, know what a takedown notification is and when to use it. And with that, I think what I'd like to do is uh, turn our time over now to Ken Horton. Thanks, Carrie. Um, welcome to everyone this morning. What I'm going to do is try to give everyone, next slide please, a high level overview of copyright law. I'd like everyone to walk away from knowing what is a copyright, what materials can be protected, what rights are granted from a copyright, how do I get, maintain, and protect a copyright, and how do I enforce my rights. Next slide please. Uh, copyrights protect subject matter is an author's original expression of an idea in a tangible medium expression, excuse me, drawings, musical scores, sculptures, software codes, and of course, tests and answers, as we all like to know. Uh, next slide, please. The categories of works that are pretty expansive, very broadly interpreted, but the statutes specifically call out the following types, literary works, musical works, dramatic works, pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works, and audiovisual works. Of course, all tests would fall within that literary works class classification. Next page, please. Next slide, sorry. Um, there are types or categories that they've originated of copyrights. The first one is called a compilation. This is a work, we often use that word in the art uh, to refer to your work of art, performed by selecting and assembling an arrangement of pre-existing materials, facts, or data. Basically, you're compiling a whole bunch of stuff and putting it together. You do not have a copyright in the original materials, but you do have it in your compilation. A collective work, think of an encyclopedia, or think of it as a, a book where there's individual chap chapters written by individual authors, is a work in which a number of contributions, which all constitute separate and independent works, think of each, each chapter written by a single author is owned by that author, but when you combine them and collect them together, the editor of that book owns the copyright in the collective work. More importantly, there's also a derivative work. This is a work that's based on one or more pre-existing works. This is where you take somebody else's work and say, I'd like to build on this, I'd like to improve it, and create my own. Now, you only own the copyright 
in your improvement, what you added to that. The original copyright, the original material still exists in the original owner or who created it. Next slide, please. Of course, a copyright only exists in original works. It comes down to originality, which is very liberally interpreted. The work need not only originate from an author and not copied from somebody else's. Um, even if you independently create something, even if it's identical, you still can own the copyright in it. For, so for example, if we created a test and without seeing somebody else's test, we came up with the exact same thing, we own the copyright in that if we independently created it. The work does not have to have literary or artistic value or quality. If there is no subject of standard here. It's just simply, I created it. Next slide, please. Of course, ideas are not copyrightable. Okay, We cannot create our, our ideas. We can create the way we express those ideas and how we create those. The rationale is that copyright laws will not give a monopoly on ideas or scientific principles which could impair cultural or scientific development. So we all want to have our copyright in the expression, but not in the original idea itself. Um, I just noticed that there's an audience question, do copyrights cut across all countries or vary from country to country? Good question. Um, I will say, yeah, we'll address this near the very end. Everything we're talking about, they vary from country to country, but at the same time, the general principles we're talking about here will apply in most countries. The details might change from country to country. Next slide, please. Um, facts and data. Facts and data calculations, they are not copyrightable either. The manner of reporting the facts and the selection and arrangement of the data are protectable. Again, this comes down to its original ideas, original, original the data facts are not protectable. It's way our way of expressing it. Um, you must be original, though. You cannot take someone else's data and present it in the exact same way and get a copyright. It's how you arrange that data that it gives you the copyright. Next slide, please. The work must be fixed in a tangible form, which is sufficiently stable and permanent or permanent to permit the work to be received, produced, otherwise communicated for a period of, uh, of more than transitory duration. What this really means is that it has to be fixed some way so that people can view it, people can see it. Otherwise, it really can't be a work of art. Next slide, please. We can. We, what had, is, um, we have one question, and that is, was engineering data copyright left off the, the type of copyright intentionally? Say that again, please. Was engineering data copyright left off the list? Um, engineering data, that's a good question. Engineering data, when you came, when you, when, if you have come up with an idea, or not idea, sorry, if you are within a company and you've created data, it is it cannot be copyrighted, the data itself. Now, you can we can protect that by another form of intellectual property called trade secrets. So the data itself is not protectable. You can still protect it by its proprietary information. You can still protect it, excuse me, protect it by not releasing it and keeping it internal, keeping it proprietary, those kind of things. But under the copyright laws, you cannot, that is not copyrightable, just the data itself just pure data. Now you can have your manner of presenting it. Let's assume you came out with, there was reams and reams of data, and you assemble it in probably the most logical and arguably the only logical way to present it. Well, that's the strongest protection because someone else is not going to be able to take that data and present it in the exact, exact same format. So if the format lends itself to presentation 1 through 100, you've protected it, that data being presented in 1 through 100. Now, someone else could take that same data, turn around, and present it in 2, 4, 6, 8, in some other format, but it wouldn't make sense for them to try to present it in that format or express it in that manner because it just, it's out of order and doesn't make sense. But there are other ways of protecting it, not through copyright, though. Um, going back to the, to the slides, the, the subject matter, what is not protected are symbols, designs, ornamentation. These are generally things that can be trademarked. Um, also, you cannot protect ideas and procedures, generally things that are patentable and patentable subject matter, and as we talked about, fact, facts and data. Next slide, please. The length of a copyright is generally the life of, life of the author, the person who created it, plus 70 years. Okay? Some information to keep in mind is when the term of the copyright starts is when it was created and when it was published. Now, the laws in the U.S. in terms of how long, and, and there's a lot of details in this, 
but it came down, it was changed in 1978. So if you're really looking at a particular length, we're saying, well, I'm getting near the, the life plus 69 years, I really need to know whether I have another year of a copyright, go back to 1978, give me a call, and I can give you the details, but at this point, it really doesn't matter to go dive into details. It's life plus, life, life plus 70. Now, I should mention, it used to be life plus 50, and that was changed, and there has been a push lately to push it to life plus 100, and there are other countries that do have this longer length of copyright. So you might see that starting to trend out in the US laws. Next slide, please. The rights you are granted with a copyright, it depends on the type of work, but specifically includes the right to reproduce, the right to distribute, the right to perform, the right to display. Now these all depend on the type of work. Of course, when we're talking about tests, the most important ones are going to the right to reproduce and the right to distribute. Well, do you really perform a test? No, so those rights don't matter. Do you display? Eh, you might display it, so that might be important as well. But you have a bundle of rights. If you walk away from this, you really think about the right to prevent a copy. In, in whatever form you are using your work of art, in here test, we have the right to prevent copying being made. It's a, so you think of that copyright, the right to prevent copying. It's a simple way of doing it. And that the details may depend, again, on the type of work. Um, next slide, please. Now, there are some limits to copyrights, OK? One of the biggest limits is called a fair use. People can use your copyrights for fair use. It is not a commercial use. The fair use includes a criticism, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Those last three, teaching, scholarship, and research, can be very tricky because it comes into the amount of commercial use. A lot of, univers a lot of universities mistakenly think, well, I can go out and use somebody else's work in my profession because I'm not making a commercial use. I'm not benefiting on it. But in the, in the university's mind, they are a for-profit institution. They are making money out of it, and they've got themselves into trouble. Usually where this comes into play is often criticism and news reporting because this comes down to our right of free expression under the First Amendment so that you're giving very broadly interpreted that I can criticize a copyright, I can report on it, Importantly, you have to be able to repeat the material that you're criticizing or reporting on and use that copyright for you to, to effectively be able to criticize it or report on that news. Um, next slide, please. Hey, Ken, this is Who, Jamie. We have a, a yeah. couple of questions about copyright. Um, okay. One is, you know, if there, what if there are multiple authors as in a committee? How does, how does that work with copyright? Okay, we are going to do that slide in about one or two slides, I think. Probably the next slide, in fact, I'll answer that. Okay, great. Okay, so who owns a copyright? Generally, the initial copyright vests in the creator or author. It's who creates it, who originates that. You can get it by um, assignment, which is a way of transferring it from one to another, or by licensing it from one to another. Um, just because you possess something doesn't mean you own the copyright simple cases, I go out and buy a CD of music. I now possess it, but I don't own the copyrights in that. That possession allows me rights within that physical embodiment I have there, but I do not own the original copyright. Next slide, please. So here comes the question about what we'll call joint works. A joint work is a work created by two or more persons, each having equal undivided interest in the work. Now you can have three, four, five, however many. Um, and in these instances, it is a joint, basically it's under the laws, it's called joint tenancy. Um, you equally own it, you equally can use it, you equally can be responsible for recouping all the rights. So when you are going out, if you have a test and you, you give a committee of three people, uh, let's say three professors say, I'd like you to create a test for me, they all come back to you, they've, they've worked together and created it, all three of them have rights and own that copyright. And under the laws, each of them can do with that how they want without answering to the other one. The only difference is that if one of them makes a whole lot of money of it and he can't keep it to himself, he has to share it with the others. There's also, this is probably the trickiest thing, is called a work made for hire. An employer or called commissioning party is considered the author, provided this is made clear to the creator or the author. Let's go back to our professor, our committee. We, as a test owner, said, we want you three professors to create a test for us. We said nothing more. We said we'd pay you about it. And they said, great. They created it, came back to us, and we said, thank you very much. We started using it. 
they came to us and said, well, we created this, we own the copyrights. Kind of shocking because we paid them for it. But under the laws, they are correct. So to prevent that, you have to make it clear that we are making this a work made for hire. It's the magic language. We are hiring you, and this is a work made for hire. When you use that language, automatically the copyright invests in you, the person who asked them to create it. This got a lot of people caught up when they were creating websites because they asked, start up a new business, said, will you create a website for you? Company, the website developer says, great, we'll create the website. They do it. Um, business starts along. The website developer comes back and says, great, now you owe us a royalty or a license to, you to continue to display this website. Caught a lot of people off guard because they didn't use that work made for hire. So that's can, trips up a lot of people. It's a little bit counterintuitive for most of us. Next slide, please. It looks like we have a poll here, and I'll go ahead and launch it. And the question is, if you pay someone to create a test for you, do you own the copyright? So Ken just talked about this. Um, I've opened up the polls. Let's go ahead and vote. We'll see what people, how people do. They were make sure they were listening. Uh, Ken, while we're waiting, I had another person ask if there is a link to uh, like a copyright application, or maybe we can provide that website information um, uh, in our follow-up email to the attendee. Yes. So, that, so they'd like a link to, just a link to a copyright application? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, looks like just about everybody has answered. We appreciate the participation. Let me go ahead and close the polls now, and we'll share the results. So uh, about, six, about half of you say, um, that if you pay someone, a company does own the copyright. Ken, Ken do you want to comment on this? Sure. Uh, it was a trick question, of course. Make sure everyone's paying attention. It really depends. Did you specify that it was a work made for hire? If you did specify a work made for the hire and you use that language, then yes, you own the copyright. If you did not, then you do not own the copyright. Next slide. Okay, great. I'm gonna that was a trick ahead. question. But 51, you know, at least uh, interesting. I always like doing that. How do you acquire a copyright? Um, it's acquired automatically when you create it. Okay, of course, the tangible medium depends on the type of work. There is no publication or no registration required, and we'll talk about those in a sec. But both of those can be advantageous under the laws. But again, it's automatically created. There's no legal formalities. There's nothing else. If you create it, you own the copyright. Now, you can enhance those by various things. We'll talk about those. Next slide, please. You can enhance these copyrights by, oh, did we, next slide? There we go. Thank you. Um, you can enhance it by publishing your work, okay? And by publishing it, basically, you're putting out tangible copies of, of soiling it, leasing it, giving it away, so people then begin to recognize this is your work. Um, publication previously is no longer... Uh, was required for obtaining a federal copyright. That no longer is the case. There can be advantages, though, for publishing it. Now, a little counterintuitive, because for most people, if you create a work of art, you don't create it to stick it in your garage. You usually are creating it so you can put it out in the marketplace, sell it. And so that's one reason they, they kind of changed. That's one reason that publication used to be a requirement, but is no longer. Next, next line, please. Next slide. Thanks. But there's a, what you put when you publish this is what's called a notice of publication. This is optional, but it can be very strong and very useful in terms of uh, for infringers, as we'll talk about. You can place it on your published work to avoid certain defenses to infringement. In other words, people say, I didn't know this was copyright. Um, the three symbols of a notice of publication are the copyright symbol, the year the work was first published, and the name of the copyright owner. Think about all the textbooks we had. You have your title page on the textbook. If you flip the page over, on the back there, it usually has the copyright notice, and it has the copyright symbol, it has the editor, McGraw-Hill, and it has the year. And of course, they often change editions for seven, seven editions. You've got seven years put there so that they have all their full copyrights put in there. That prevents somebody from saying, well, I didn't know this, this textbook was copyrighted. It's a very simple thing to do in the digital era to put a footer in with this notice of copyright on the bottom so that you can always have it in all the tests and everything else you have there. Now, it does not have to be pervasive on every single page. It just has to be placed on it so that somebody picking that up would be put on notice that this is your copyrighted work. Next slide, please. 
so registration. I've got a, a couple of I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, let's say that a specific item bank or exam is protected by copyright, um, and there's another exam program or test. Does that mean that that exam is protected as well, or do you need to get copyright on all of your tests for under a, a given program? Very good. Um, I'm I'm going to make an assumption here, uh, not knowing exactly the testing industry that when we talk about a, a test bank, that there are different versions of tests. Um, and this might be destroying one of the polls that I put out here later, but uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and address. Well, actually, let's wait for the poll. Let me wait. There's a poll question that actually addresses that. We'll have people ask, ask that or answer the poll, and then I'll come back with the answer to answer the question. OK. Um, registration for copyrights. This is an optional procedure. We're talking about federal registration. There is no state registration at all. Uh, it is optional. Now, it can be very helpful because there are statutory advantages. One, you're presumed the owner. When you file a copyright application with the US Copyright Office, you are automatically presumed the owner. You don't have to prove that. In a litigation or a lawsuit, you sometimes have to prove that. The biggest thing that is important, two things, is one, you can get statutory damages. When you enforce your copyright, you know, we're all damaged. We often come up to an instance of saying, well, how much was I damaged? And proving that. Well, if you have a federally registered copyright, it's no longer a matter of proof. It says up to $30,000 per infringing act per every single time someone made a copy of it. Now, that is completely up to the judge's discretion of how much that is awarded. But it's, it's nice because you don't have to actually prove all the damages. You just say, judge, I want you to give me the statutory damage and as high as you can go. I'd like it. He awards it, and it's for every infringing act. Importantly, it is also a prerequisite to filing suit against an alleged infringer. If you want to enforce your copyrights, before you can step into a US district court in any state, you have to have a registered copyright. Other words, the, the, the suit will be dismissed. Uh, a recommendation legally is always register within three months of first publication to preserve all of your rights. And that's, of course, we'll talk about why you may or may not want to do that every single time. Well, let's talk about it. Every time you file these, there's a cost and logistical. I often recommend to my clients of let's it's a startup, someone's getting in the music industry. I'm like, yeah, that's great. You could file every time you create a music or a new track or a new song, you can register with a copyright. But you're going to soon run up a legal legal tab that's quite expensive. I tell them often, you know, go out, test your market, start seeing how it goes. When you start having success in the marketplace, when you start seeing a lot of traction, that's when you start thinking, hmm. I ought to start protecting my copyrights by filing, filing them because if there's a lot of traction in the marketplace, that's when people are going to start copying. That's when people are start using it. May not, apply so, may not apply so much in the realm of the test taking because it's not the exact same dynamics, but it still kind of gives the idea of, well, it can run up a legal tab, so you have to use some kind of business judgment about how much you want to go ahead and get a, a registration. But putting that notice of publication Every time you create it, whether or not you register it, can still be a very powerful tool with a very low cost. Next slide, please. Um, to register the copyright, it's very simple. There's an application you fill out. It's one or two pages. It's not very long. It's deposited with the US Copyright Office. There's a fee, uh, a minimal fee, I think a couple hundred dollars. The examination only considers, is this original? Can it be fixed in a tangible medium? And is it proper subject matter? That's it. That's all done. It's, there is no review of whether it's good enough. There's no review of anything else. Um, they will then stamp it with the, with the registration number, send you, send you a certificate of registration back. It's usually six months, six to a month to a year, and it does not take long. It's simple. But if you look at every time you want to file a copyright application, you can then begin to understand the costs and the logistics begin to add up the more registrations you pursue. Next slide, please. I think this is to address the question. There we go. So here's our poll I've just launched. And do you need to register every version of your test with the Copyright Office for protection? So let's go ahead and, and uh, have people vote. Let a few more people put their votes in here. We're going to go ahead and close the polls now and look at the results.
So can some people say yes, some people say no? Uh, well, it's a, it's, again, a little bit, it's, it's, it really depends how you define protection. Do you need to register every version of your test? No. You do automatically get protection. Let's assume we create, let's go back to the question of every single test bank that we created numerous versions of a test. I, I'm going to use a number of 10. We've gone out there and we've created 10 different versions of the test. Now, what we should do every time we create a different version is put that notice of publication on the bottom of the front of the test so that everyone understands that somewhere that it's very dominant. Now, we are protected, but as we said, if we ever went to enforce this, we don't have statutory damages. We wouldn't be able to enforce it in, in federal court. Our options are limited. So we do have some protection. If, for example, we had a test, one of these tests, or every one of them had this notice of publication, and we used numbers three and five, and they wound up on the internet, we still have protection. We still have the copyright. We could still pursue those websites saying, listen, we've got a copyright here. It's, it's important to us. Please take it down. Everyone agrees to take it down. Well, let's, let's assume for number eight, though, that we put it out there, and it went to one of the nasty websites that we don't like. Well, they'd look at this and say, oh, that's great, you have the copyright. They check into it and say, well, you never registered with the trademark or the copyright office. So we understand you can't sue us for this. You can't go after us for this. So basically, we're going to tell you to go jump in the lake. Um, and that's true. You can't actually take them to court. So if push came to shove, then you'd say, all right, I've seen test number eight out there is being widely distributed. I'm going to have to run, file that version with the copyright office. The day I get their, the day I get the registered copyright, then I could go against use against test number eight to that nefarious website and have it take it down. So that kind of gives you a perspective of yes, you have some limited protection with our registration, but for the full benefits, you need to register every version with it. Hey Ken, can so you also? Uh, yes. People have asked about um, where the copyright office is. It's uh, Washington D.C. In fact, I think. It's uh, copyright copyright.gov. Let me double check that. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. It is back in Washington, D.C. Copyright, yeah, copyright.gov. So if you start looking in here and you have some questions, wanted more details, the Copyright Office does have a good, um, last I checked, a good kind of orientation for copyright basics, or copyright, in fact, on their homepage, a good copyright basics excuse me, frequently asked questions, just some general generalities of, the, of what you might need to know when you start looking at registration and, and playing around in this space. Okay, let me get back. Sorry, I had to jump off the slides for a second. Um, enforcing your copyrights. Um, a lot of times, the legal requirements to prove infringement, that someone else has infringed your copyright, is that you have to show you're the owner. Again, this is one of the benefits of having it registered is that you don't have to show that. You automatically are the owner. Sometimes this can come down because you believe you're the owner. You're in a company. Let's go back to our, our, our example of hiring three professors to create a test for us. We hired them and they did it. Well, unbeknownst to us, what they really did was turn around and just basically took somebody else's work and presented it to us. We don't own the copyright in that instance. Now, we have probably some words to have with our professors for not creating an original work, but that's sometimes where the ownership in, comes into is to say, we are the owner. Then you have to show proof of copying. In before the digital era, this was sometimes difficult to show that it was there was proof of copying. So the, we often look to what was called indirect proof, and that is, was there access to this work? Was there substantial similarity between the two? And the courts would have a sliding scale between these. The more access you had, the less substantial similarity it had to be. Or the less, the less access, the more substantially similar. Um, let's take a good uh, example of an architectural, where we p ask someone to create, we have a copyright in an architectural drawing. You know, I look at that and I decide, oh, I'm going to build my house a little bit differently. I, I go out and move a wall here and move a window here. Is that copy? Well, if I can prove I had direct access, substantially similar, they'll give me a little more leeway on this. In the digital era, it almost doesn't matter, because what has been happening, what are we all concerned with? It's just, it is the exact same copy. There's no question. Kids are walking in, or, you know, looking in the music and the retail industry, it's been direct copies of music, direct copies of movies. 
Do we have to worry about showing proof of copy that it's been copied? No, because it's the exact same thing. In our industry, it's the same thing. These tests are being pulled up and posted verbatim, exactly the same. So there's never really a question of, is this copying? So if you federally register the copyright, it becomes very simple stepping into court to say, here's my registration. I'm the owner. Here's proof of copying. Here's my test. Here's theirs. It's the exact same judge. Case closed. And then you proceed on that question. Next slide, please. Um, enforcement, what can you get when you enforce? The, probably the strongest thing we have or that we want is the injunction. That is the power to stop someone from using, posting, distributing any of those rights of our copyrighted work. Uh, in our case, that would be websites having to take it down. Go out there and automatically taking those down. Of any offending party, they would have to take those materials off. Um, with, with, where they're not digital copies, you can actually impound them. Um, if they're CDs, if they're DVDs, you can actually impound those. And of course, money. Now they can either be actual money, which we go in and prove the damages, or again, this is the statutory damages, where we talked about the, the real strong per infringing act at the discretion of the court. Now there is a nice kicker here, and a lot of intellectual properties and in copyrights, is you can get increased damages, where you can show there was willful infringement where someone went out there and basically thumbed their nose at you and said, I don't care if it's your copyright, I'm going to do it anyway. You can actually get willful damages. That can be up to triple damages of what you had. So if you stepped into court, you found someone, and usually the court will look at where someone did willful infringement, is where the judge is going to give them a higher amount per infringing, per infringing act. Why? Because it just looks really bad. Um, so if you have one of these nefarious websites, which are really not being cooperative, really difficult, and you actually go down the road of litigating against them, you can actually get a, a higher statutory award, and you can increase those damages based on their willful infringement. Next slide, please. Um, as well, don't forget that it is also can be criminal. And you've seen this a lot, a lot more where the digital era has become more important is it not just about monetary damages, you can actually have criminal enforcement of your um, materials. Now, that requires the government to get involved. And there's a whole different, we could probably present a whole different webinar on getting the government involved. But if they do, you know, it's not merely damages anymore. They're talking about prison, going to jail. Importantly, this is probably one of the important topics for us to talk about is indirect infringement. Direct infringement, where I go out and I catch the party who's doing the infringement. Okay, I catch, for example, the student that the one is, is taking the copy of the test on his phone and sending it out, or somehow getting copy and putting it out there. That's direct infringement, because we're finding the party that did the infringing act. Well, a lot of time out there, it's really hard to find the person who actually did the direct infringement. But you can go use indirect infringement. Now, this is an instance where the indirect infringer, let's use an example of a student or a user on a website posting a test, and then the website itself. You have to ask, does the website have the right and ability to control the infringer's acts? Does the website receive a financial benefit from the infringement? Knowledge, however, is not necessary. They do not have to know. It can be a very strong possibility to use for not so much the websites where they have users where they're not really sure what's going on there, but where there are websites out there which are profiting, and it's usually when you want to use this, where they're profiting from somebody else putting those tests up there where they have a user uploaded and they give, they charge access rights, so they charge pay per click for people actually accessing those tests. They're making money off this. So they have the right and ability to control this infringing act and they receive financial benefit from it. That can be very, very strong. But again, it's for the websites that generally don't know it's there, indirect infringement is probably not an option that we want to go down the road of. So next poll, next slide, sorry. Yeah, the next slide is a poll, and the question is, can someone legally modify your questions and answers and post them online? So polls are open. Give everyone a little bit of time to think about it and respond. You know, I had a question earlier, Ken, about what about uh, U.S. government materials? Can those be copyrighted? Um, that's a very good question. I, I've never actually had someone ask me that. I think the answer is, 
Uh, I can't think. I think they could be copyrighted. You know, under the laws they could be, but I just don't think the federal government ever does or would have any reason to because in most instances they're doing it as a public service. They want to kind of give that away. But that's a really good question. I'd, I'd actually, I'd have to look into that and follow up, honestly. It, theoretically, yes, but I just have never come across an instance of where that might matter. So the person who actually asked that question might have a specific, um, specific uh, uh, scenario in mind that we'd have to answer. So final questions, I can follow them. Not a, theoretically, yes, but I just don't think they would. OK. Uh, here's the results of our poll. Most people, about half the people said no. Uh, someone cannot legally modify questions. Um, any comments on that? Uh, yes. So a question comes is, wh what is it when they're modifying the questions? If, if I'm a student and I go in and take a test, now, and then I go out and I sit down and I said, you know, remember, it's not facts and ideas cannot be copyrighted. It's the expression of how to do. If we have a student sit through that and say, you know what, he's not a photographic memory, just has a really smart guy who says, oh, that's great. Now, I'm going to go over and I'm going to create my own test, which is similar. Now, if, now, he's had access to this, but as long as he's not, if he walks away and he doesn't have the test, he just generally remembers it, he sits down and independently creates it, the question becomes, this is kind of this infringement of how substantially similar is it? Um, if he... If, if he, you know, the longer it took, the more he forgot, the more likely it is that he just expressed this in his own way. It comes very fact-specific in terms of yes or no. Legally, can he do that? Yes, but provided it's an independent, he independently creates it, and he can show that he was not using his memory of those specific test questions to create it. So it's a very, this is a, there is no right answer to this. It very comes fact-specific about what he did. Now, We'll use two different scenarios. The student walks out. The first thing he does is sits down and writes all of them down from memory. Is there probably copyright infringement there? Yes, because what is he doing? I mean, he's using his direct access that he had there to create his own version. Is he really creating his original work of original work here? No, because what's he doing? He's using his memory off of our copyright work to create his own. Let's use a different scenario where. You know, the student, a couple weeks goes by, and the professor goes, you know what, I lost that test. I can't access it anymore. It's gone. Could you create me something similar? And the student goes, well, gee, I, I, you know, I dumped my brain. I vaguely remember. But I generally remember the subject, and I can kind of sit down and, and walk through it. Here, there's probably a whole lot more independent creation that the, that the student has done. So it comes down to this, how much independent creation has the student done? And that can be very fact-specific. Next slide, please. OK, moving on to um, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA. This provides safe harbors for online content providers. And think of these as the websites, the Yahoo's, the Facebooks, the Google. If they store material at a request of a user or subscriber, are merely referring users to online locations where the material is located. They're not doing the store. They store it for someone else. They can tell people, well, this is where it's at. They're not actually doing the storing themselves. They can store, but only by system caching, basically a temporary copy. They, in essence, they are an intermediary and store material while serving as a conduit. The whole purpose behind the DMCA is that when the internet came out is there's a lot of people out there who really are intermediaries. And there was a lot of copyright infringement. And they're like, they were very fearful of being exposed to infringement just by virtue of other people's actions. But their business model requires them to have this material on their website. Now, this DMC, as we'll talk about, is used a lot in what we call the notice and takedown. But there have recently, in the last two years, been some modifications proposed in the US Congress to make this stronger for copyright owners. As we'll see, this process to try to get infringing material taken off websites can be a little tricky and can take some time. And copyright owners, is that there was a balance given between copyright owners and freedom of expression here. The last couple of years, they've tried to shift that more to copyright owners, That that balance of power, but it has actually not passed the US Congress yet. But I would expect that in the next couple of years, you might see that going through. Next slide, please. Um, to be eligible, this online content provider for the DMCA has to adopt, implement, and inform its subscribers of its policy for terminating repeat offenders. 
basically a subscription agreement or a user agreement saying, listen, this is the copyright laws, this is what our policy is. It must not accommodate and, and not must accommodate, excuse me, and not interfere with standard works to identify and protect copyrighted works. So if we're going out there and we're trying standard materials to go out there and find infringing copyright, they cannot prevent that from happening. Now the online confidence providers, they do not need to monitor or affirmatively seek out copyright infringement, as except as part of what their standard measures they might employ or that we might employ. There's no monitoring. They don't have to go out and do it. Now, some, some organizations will, but there is no requirement. They, do, they need not have, have, have to have access to remove or block material if that action is prohibited by law. So next slide, please. So the way to go about basically going down the notice and takedown is identify the copyrighted work. Okay, Identify, which is our, our copyrighted work. Here's a copy of my test. Identify the infringing material with sufficient detail. You have to say to Yahoo, Yahoo, here is where this infringing material is located at. Here's the URL. Here's where it's at. Something which tells them this is where it is. Um, you have to give sufficient contact information for them to contact you. You have to certify that you are the copyright owner or agent. Now, this comes down to whether if you have a, a sort of, or sorry, a registered copyright, it's a very simple thing to send them this the registration certificate or a copy of it. But on the other hand, if we've never registered it yet, you can still send them a copy of it and say, see, please, here's our notice of, co notice of publication at the bottom. This was done in 2012, and give them some idea which verifies that you are the copyright owner. Now, sometimes the difficult part is to find who to send it to. This you have to find out the finance and the notification to the service provider. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of digging to find out, as we all know, what website is running and operating this? Who's the owning this? Who's the responsible party there? Sometimes that requires a little bit of investigation work because they don't want people to know who's running it. You know, they do that on purpose. So you have to sometimes find the who is search, domain name search, go into those areas of the website and find those who's the registered owner or registered agent of that website. Next slide, please. Okay, next poll. So here's our next poll, and it's, can you stop infringement by someone posting your tests in Germany? Uh, the polls are open, so go ahead and uh, answer this question. <coughs> we'll, we'll leave it open for just a few more seconds. And as we've seen before, this is a tricky question. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, close the poll and share the results. Yeah. Well, can some about half say yes and half are not sure? Good. Um, so I'm not actually going to answer this poll except possibly. That's what I'm going to say because we're going to address this in the next slide. So in international considerations, the protection is limited to each country. So if I get a US federal copyright registration, it is limited to the US. If I want to enforce my rights in Germany, I have to go qualify for copyright uh, copyright protection in Germany. Now, they might Germany might have, like ours, limited protection by just having a notice of copyright. They may not. They may actually require you to actually have it registered with the German Copyright Office and able to get full rights in that. Depends on the German laws. Now, the, again, similar laws, but we just have to find out what are the specific requirements in Germany. Your enforcement is also limited to each country. I have a U.S. copyright. I cannot take my U.S. copyright registration and go over in Germany. I cannot enforce it over there. Now, with that said, my enforcement is not just limited to things that are sold or marketed here. It also is anything importing coming across the borders. It's a little bit trickier in terms of websites because sometimes they have to have some kind of U.S. operations. Even though U.S. users can view the website, if it's owned and operated over in Germany, it's you probably have to go over to Germany to shut them down because that's where their physical location is. Um, if you begin to think about, you know, we talked a little bit about trying to seek protection some of the costs. You begin to say, if I have to go get protection, not well, not even not just enforcement, but protection in every single country, it becomes a matter of cost versus benefit. Okay, where 
where are the countries where I'm going to see a lot of my tests being used or where where it, it's kind of like if I have three main markets in Germany in the US and in Japan that's probably where I want to have protection now if I also see the enforcing the rights becomes a cost versus benefit analysis that's where I operate maybe it's worth having protection for most of my tests in those three countries but if I see that the offending website are often located in Malaysia for example then that's maybe where I want to have protection as well because that's where I might likely have to have those enforcement rights. I want to be able to twist the arm of the party in Malaysia using the courts in Malaysia. But do I want to go into every single country? Most likely not. I just don't have the resources and I don't have the money to do that. So it look, you kind of have to take a very educated look at where are my markets, where are the people infringing most often. That's where I probably want to try and protect. Next slide, please. Um, so what I want you to take away from all this legal avenues sometimes can be limited because of logistics and cost. The difficult thing is once the test is out there, it's like the cat's out of the bag. It is so easy to be distributed over so many websites that it, you know, sometimes illegal avenues, they're there, but you just don't want to shoot from the hip every time you see one to go running to a legal process. As we, as Terry had mentioned, there are you want to try a lot of other avenues first. Ask nicely first, ask nicely again. Um, with The last thing you want is to burn somebody who is going to form a very nice cooperative relationship with you. And most legitimate websites are going to work with you about this because they don't want to have the stain of having infringement either. They're going to work out there, not to say that they're automatically going to roll over and do what you want, but if you're going down this process and sending out takedown notices and people reply back and they're very congenial, you know, just because they push back a little hard doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to not work with you. They just want to say, well, you know, they have to keep the, their users and the rights of their users in mind as well. They're kind of threading the needle here. They're on the kind of fence between you and between the users. So they have to, have to kind of remember that, well, our users have certain rights and they have this, and we've agreed to this, we just want to make sure what you're saying is valid before we really push against our users. But when you've done all that and it and you're still seeing a lot of rampant infringement and it's somebody that's not going to cooperate with you, they're not going to help you, you want to hit hard and hit fast because what you want to try to do, the longer that material is out there, the more likely that it's going to be copying distributed. It's very hard to stuff that cat back in the bag. So if you can see it and you can get it quickly and hammer it hard, you keep how many others other of the tests out of circulation, the better off you are. And Carrie, with that, I'm going to turn it back to you. Great. Thanks so much, and that was fantastic information. Um, I just wanted to touch on a few more points before we wrap up today. Um, as Ken mentioned, the DMCA is, uh, notification is an option for all instances of copyright infringement. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's not always necessary. You can also choose to send an informal notification or what we call a bystander letter. Now, this is not a legally recognized notification, but it happens to be highly effective. What we suggest is sending a friendly bystander letter first to see if you get compliance. And if not, and you're certain it's a case of true copyright infringement, then a DMCA letter can always be sent as a follow-up. Next slide, please. Now, this, this slide is an actual example of how bystander letters and DMC letters can be very effective. Um, and uh, occasionally it's necessary to send multiple letters until the proper person of the website is made aware of the issue, but typically you'll get a response from the website within 24 hours. Now what this slide shows is an actual client example of one of Caveon's clients and the top 10 infringing sites during a specific period. So the sites range anywhere from Yahoo at the top end to little small sites to brain mass. They, they kind of run the gamut, but the point of this is that there were a total of 846 threats for this particular exam. Now, with a combination of mostly bystander letters and a few DMCA letters, within a 24 to 48 hour period, 99% of those infringements were eliminated, uh, not to ever return. So in combination with building the relationship, sending out the bystander letters, <laughs> and occasionally having to do a DMCA letter, 
it's a great way to quickly and in most cases permanently remove that threat to your content. Now, Ken also mentioned that there can be challenges internationally because of different copyright laws or the non-existence of copyright laws for, for U.S. Uh, material. But bystander letters are fantastic. And so is relationship building for getting things removed. If you can build a, a relationship with the site owner through a friendly bystander letter and just several interactions, um, we have nearly the same high amount of success as we do uh, domestically. So there are still tools without really having to worry about all of the, the um, cost versus benefit analysis that having copyright protection overseas can present. Um, and it can be highly successful for it. So to wrap up, next slide please. After identifying the breadth and depth of your content exposure, sending out an olive branch to site and forum operators, sending out the appropriate takedown notifications, ultimately what comes down as the key tool is persistence. Persistence is the key to building these alliances with the website, getting the infringed content removed quickly to protect the security of your intellectual property from outside threats. Thank you very much for, for attending. I'm going to turn the time back over to Jamie. Oh, I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, we had a number of questions, and so I think I'll just ask one question before we close today's webinar, um, and that is, are there inter-country agreements where they, uh, where they recognize U.S. copyright? Yes. Um, there are international treaties where they are not, per se, international copyright. That, that does not exist. What the treaties allow you to do is base a registration in another country using your US registration. So if I go out, present a, or a file for a registered copyright in the US, when I go to Germany, I can go to Germany and say, listen, I would like to use my US registration to help smooth the process of getting the registration done in Germany. So they allow that to happen. There are no international copyrights per se. It still has to go country to country, but at a layout, basically these treaties allow it to make it a smoother and cheaper process rather than having to go to every single country and repeat the process over and over and over. All right, thank you so much. We are running out of time for our webinar today. I want to thank everybody for attending, and I especially would like to thank our presenters today, Ken Horton and Carrie Straw. Um, here, here's their information. Again, if you'd like to follow us, you can follow us on Twitter at, at Cavion. Check out our blog, our weekly blog at Cavion.com, and join our group on LinkedIn. Thank you so much, and we look forward to having you join us next for next month's webinar.